Hello. Today we look at the risks of investing and how you can manage them. Of course you can't do that by completely eliminating all types of risk. And you certainly can't do it in such a way that you achieve high returns without any risk at all. But you can do several things apart from these. The first you can do, that you acknowledge it and you pay attention to it, so you can take action if necessary. On the other hand, because every investment is affected by different types of risk, you can choose the instrument that best suits you and your goals. Last but not least, you can build your investment basket by not only monitoring assets individually, but also optimizing the overall risk of your entire portfolio. You can even do this by ensuring that the assets in it complement each other in this respect. When it comes to investment risk, there is a lot to read in a lot of places, much of which has been covered in previous videos. I'm thinking of things like counterparty risk, credit risk, country risk, currency risk, and many others that you might come across in the description of any mutual fund. But today we're going to look at it from a completely different type of approach. The risks to your investment can be basically divided into two categories. One is market risk and the other is individual risk. Market risk typically refers to macroeconomic processes that affect the price of a wide range of investment products. Examples include inflation, changes in economic growth, or even changes in investor behavior. This type of risk cannot really be eliminated by diversification, as it affects almost the entire range. The only thing you can do is to adjust the composition of your own investment basket according to which composition is currently most beneficial to you. A quick example of this in the case of inflation is that if the inflationary environment is as high as it is now, you will choose an asset that will at least hold the value, given the time available. Individual risk is a slightly different matter, after all, it mostly only affects the price of the particular investment. An example is events affecting the asset, for example events with the issuer. But individual risk is your own decision, that when to buy or sell an asset, and to what extent. If you are not a large capital holder, the latter will obviously have less impact on the price, but it will have a bigger impact on your results. And the latter is what makes you do all the risk management. Now that we have looked at how we can group risk, let's also look at how you can manage it. The first, and most emphasized, solution is diversification. This is when you invest your money in more assets. Then the poorer return on one asset is compensated by the better return on another. This can happen in several ways. For example, you can split your money between assets. In this case, you choose assets that respond to the same effect in completely different ways. Such as the gold and equity pair. Or you choose a lower risk asset next to a riskier one. In this way, if the price of one asset falls, your total wealth will only feel it depending on the weighting. The other way to diversify is to diversify by area. Here you can choose a single asset class, but you select them from geographical areas where a major boom is expected. Or you can even split your money between industries. A given economic effect will favor one company in one economic sector and not another. If you allocate your money accordingly, you will be less exposed. Of course you can use them not only separately, but also in any variation. But you can also create a diversified portfolio by using a mutual fund either actively or passively managed. Another option is to use long-term investments. For an average investment, daily returns typically do not have much relationship to the previous day's returns. In other words, you will not be able to predict, or in many cases even necessarily estimate, what to expect the next day. Then if you look at the long term, you will see that the market is basically going up. So the worse returns in shorter periods are compensated for by better returns in longer periods. This is nothing else than diversification over time. Let's look at the reason behind time diversification. If I want to be very precise, I can say that the standard deviation of the return over a period varies with the root of the length of the period, while the total return over a period is a linear function of the length of the period. Before you run away, the same simplification means that if your investment returns a stable 10% over a given period, it will return 20% in twice as long a period, 
while the price deviates less and less from the expected return. In this way you will achieve a longer term actual return that is closer to the expected return. The next opportunity for risk management is to know your own risk tolerance. If you know your own risk tolerance, you will know which instruments are right for you and will help you achieve your goals, and which ones are not advisable for the time being. You may be in desperate need of the returns of an asset with a higher return outlook, or it may just sound good to have an asset that can do quite a lot. But it will only do so if it's in the right environment and used properly. In other words, if it's right for your goals, your capabilities and your knowledge, there's a good chance you'll get nice results with it. Otherwise, it's likely to cause loss, or the least some annoyance. Your own risk tolerance and preparedness is probably something you can guess yourself. If not, I have created a test to help you determine this, which you can access via the link in the description. After an overview of grouping and treatment, let's look at measuring risk. The measurement is absolutely necessary in that it will provide a basis for comparison. But in order to measure it, you must know what you are looking for. We sometimes hear that risk is nothing more than the slope of the yield curve. This is not the case at all. In Hungary in the pre-2010 period, it was not uncommon for banks to offer 10% interest rates, which were typically no riskier than the half a percent annual interest rate we are now seeing. After all, the average yield at the bank was the predetermined value at each point in time, so you wouldn't be too surprised at the end of the investment period. What we are looking for is nothing more than a deviation from the average. To do this, you can use the standard deviation, which shows the deviation from the average over a given period. The greater the deviation from the average, the greater the volatility, and therefore the greater the risk of investing. Although it was mentioned in the section on volatility that volatility in itself does not equal risk, it is a pretty good illustration of it. In addition to standard deviation, you can also use variance. This is the square of the standard deviation. You can see that there is a relationship between the two, so a high standard deviation will also mean a high variance, which will show a high risk. The standard deviation can be negative, so it shows the direction of change. After squaring it, you will only see positive values, so with variance you can more easily observe the trend of the variance. Some metrics are specifically designed to measure risk. One of these is the maximum exchange rate loss. It shows you how much you would have lost if you had entered at the highest point in the period under consideration and then sold your investment at the end of the period. The calculation is as following. You divide the maximum price of the period by the price at the end of the period, then subtract 1 to see the change as a percentage. The maximum value of this indicator can be 0%. After all, we are calculating a maximum exchange rate loss. If we look at a case where the exchange rate is continuously rising and you sell your investment at the very end of the period, it is right at the maximum. You can also see from the formula that if the highest rate is also the last rate, then the fraction will be 1, subtracting 1 from that gives you 0%. When calculating this indicator, only the maximum point and the last exit point are important. In other words, even if there is a significant drop in the meantime, it does not count here. After all, it is assumed that you only sell your investment at the end of the period, at which point you realize the result achieved. If you want to calculate at the lowest point of the downturn, that will be the last date of another period. Beta is also a measure. Beta shows the average change in the value of an investment if the market changes by 1%. In other words, as long as you can reduce individual risk by diversification, the risk expressed by beta must be borne by all investors. The beta of each investment is always relative to the market, so the market beta is always 1, after all the change in value of the market is then compared to itself. The value of beta can be greater than 1, in which case the movement of your investment relative to the market is greater. In other words, the investment has a higher risk than the average. If beta takes a value between 0 and 1, the investment is risky but below the level of market risk. If beta is 0, 
the investment has no market risk, so it does not react to movements. This does not make it risk-free, as it may still have an individual risk. If beta is between minus 1 and 0, then the investment moves in the opposite direction to the market, but is less risky than the market. If beta is below minus 1, it moves in the opposite direction to the market and has above average risk. Negative beta is typical for countercyclical investments, for example the gold, which are subject to the opposite of the market. While it is important to monitor the value of this indicator, note that it is not 100% accurate either. There are times when it may be distorted and thus give you a false result. In the case of less liquid markets, such as real estate markets, there may be a significant delay before the effect of a market change is reflected due to a lack of sufficient turnover. Even if it does appear, it may not be to the extent that the price change is actually and reasonably reacted to, after all, who can remember what it was six months ago? For these markets beta is also an important indicator, but keep in mind that you will probably be working with past data that is no longer current. Of course, you can calculate not only the beta of individual investment vehicles, but also the beta of your entire investment portfolio. This will give you an idea of how risky your own investment basket is overall compared to the market. The portfolio beta is the weighted average of the betas of the investments that make up the portfolio. There is nothing particularly voodoo about it. It works the same way as a fruit smoothie. If you have apples and pears, and you mix them together, the smoothie will taste more like apples or pears depending on how much of each you put in. It works the same way here. The closer the beta of the investment basket is to the beta of the investment vehicle, the higher the proportion of the investment basket that is represented. Thus adding countercyclical investments so investments with negative beta to an investment with a positive beta allows you to reduce the overall risk of the portfolio.